This picture, as you can see, was taken in a busy American city. This picture was taken at exactly the same time and at the same spot. Question, how was it done? A modern motion picture camera photographed the traffic in action, while the Daguerre camera, the great-great-granddaddy of all cameras, was used to photograph the buildings alone. The action of this camera is so slow that there isn't time for moving objects to register on the film. On the other hand, the buildings being stationary gradually formed a sharp, clear image. And why use the Daguerre camera? To show that any picture of America without automobiles is hopelessly out of date. In the motor capital of the world, they're trying something new in a campaign to make careless drivers and absent-minded pedestrians stop, look, and listen. This roving voice of the police is a watchdog of traffic, giving orders at just the right time to make both drivers and jaywalkers safety conscious, like this. Please, lady, always look at the traffic signal before you step from the curb. Red signal lights mean that pedestrians as well as motorists should stop and wait. Mr. Motorist, be careful. This is the voice of safety speaking. Do not double park your car. When you do, you not only violate the traffic ordinance, you also create a traffic hazard. And is his face red? The traffic officers are finding this a good way to save wear and tear on their pencils. And it's a lot quicker than writing tickets. And so, around Detroit, the voice of safety travels, a constant reminder to motorists and pedestrians to think, not once, but twice.
looks ugly. I don't think it's ugly at all. Downtown Detroit's beautiful. Detroit is the best big city in the country. Yeah, I don't like cities. It's a city with the widest range of people that you can imagine. City. Television and radio stations are competitive. The newspapers are competitive. I think it is one of the best newspapers in the United States. On the face of it, it's just another peace march. But it can't be just another story. The reporter must find an approach that makes it come alive and have meaning for the reader. An approach that gets at both sides of the question. In this case, there was an obvious way to do it. There were essentially two stories, and I followed both of them. First, to ask the people who were there why they were there, in their own words. And then talk to the people along the parade route and ask them what they thought of this demonstration of the spectacle and weave those two together. It was a delightful contrast. I think it's disgusting. I think the way they're going about this protest business is all wrong. Going down there shouting obscene language down the street. What, what kind of a protest is that? It's nothing. Do you think they have the right to protest? Or? Yeah, they, everybody's got a right to protest if they're uh, in a, if they know what they're talking about and know what, they're, what is right and wrong, what, what is wrong. So you don't, you don't think they know what they're doing? I don't think any of them know what they're doing. They want to protest just to be protesting, that's all, anything. Anything that comes up, they want to protest about. A Detroit news photographer. On many assignments, pictures are as important as words. Uh, it sounds like a silly question, but why are you here? Well, I'm here because I feel strongly that the war must end. And then uh, now. We're building a gas chamber for you. Difference of opinion always makes for a good story, but a reporter must document it, not aggravate it. The risk is he may aggravate it without meaning to, just because he's there. You put that communist flag down, traitor! No! Please! No! Taking no chances, he leaves the parade early to phone in his story. Yeah, all set. And my war protesters stage their version Memorial Day Parade. Yeah. One thing no one foresaw was the rebellion of a number of young people today against the establishment. An establishment represented by their elders as well as institutions like the news. Anyone who is working for the Detroit News is very much inside the establishment and they're trying to write and relate to people who are really entirely outside of the establishment and they can't do that. To reach across the gap, the news has been angling many of its stories directly at Detroit's youth. The editor of the feature department makes a special point of it. A newspaper of the future is in its youth and in its youthful readers. And if we don't get the young reader to have respect for us and read us, then we stand a chance of not getting them when he is more along in years. Another unforeseen event was the rise in street crime in the inner city. Unfortunately, the black community reacted to a news campaign to cut down on the crime as criticism of blacks. It led to a short-lived boycott of the paper. Today, black opinion has improved, but news columnist June Brown sometimes gets an earful when she goes after an interview for a story. Gertie, uh, you know, I'm writing this column for the Detroit News, so I want to know what my friends are thinking about the Detroit news. Do you, do you take the uh, 
me personally or just my friends? I want to know what you personally think. Do you do you take the daily news? No, I don't take it anymore. I just take it now on Sunday. And you remember this crime back yeah. here? They had this big article in the paper about they would have about 20 blacks and two whites. You mean that crime in the street? Yeah, the crime in the covered. street. Yeah. And nobody done no crime but the black people. According to? According to the news. Yeah. And I didn't like that. I feel like that little phony. Well, that was my personal opinion about it. You know, then my customers, too. They call me up and tell me, you taking the news? Well, stop. They read the paper. <laughs> So you and I decided that I would tell everybody else the same thing, you know. Uh-huh. What do you think? What could the news do to make you buy it again? Tell it like it is.
I will protect. A word remindful of the days when knights wore armor to defend their walled cities against invaders. Sometimes Joe was sent out for duty at school crossing. Experienced officers of the police department's youth bureau worked with the schools, teaching traffic laws and laws of courtesy to our youth of Detroit. To help them become useful citizens of tomorrow by taking part of the responsibility today. Little by little, Joe learned the insight, patience and tact a police officer needs to carry on his work. He was learning fast. Each day before an officer begins his tour of duty, he is required to copy the information posted on the teletype board. This review ensures prompt action on missing persons, stolen cars, and persons wanted for investigation by the police department. Joe spent some of his time on duty checking car licenses, training his eyes to observe, and his mind to remember descriptions of persons wanted. It wasn't an important arrest, and Joe wasn't a hero. But for the first time, he felt as though he really was a police officer. And somehow, his uniform seemed to fit better. The police department thought so, too. At the end of six months probation, Joe received his certificate confirming him as a patrolman. Not for the one arrest he made, but because in his whole probation period, he had proved himself to be alert willing to take orders and carry them out, and firm but courteous in his contacts with the public. As a patrolman, Joe began to understand the real significance of police work, the steady workaday jobs, such as checking houses where occupants are on vacation and have left an open invitation to housebreakers. It was his job to prevent crime whenever possible. Once in a while, he found himself working with a younger generation on his beat. Youngsters who have a yen to find out what the world outside their yard is like and discover it's pretty big and confusing when mother isn't there. Yes, Joe got to know his area pretty thoroughly. He forgot about wanting to be a hero. There were plenty of other compensation. Of course, there were dozens of times when he had to do things that weren't pleasant like giving a ticket to someone parked willfully in a no-parking zone. But it was all a part of his job. It was a long time in coming, but he was finally assigned to a two-way radio car, car 88. It meant a great deal to him, a successful step in his career. He met the man who was to be his partner, an experienced patrolman from whom he could learn a great deal. Car 88 was a part of a carefully planned system devised for the patrolling of the city of Detroit every hour of the day and night. Here's how the system works. The city of Detroit is divided into police precincts. Each precinct is divided into scout car territories, the number depending upon the size of the precinct and the amount of activity in that precinct. The two men who transmit orders to scout cars, the radio dispatcher and the dispatch clerk, are always veterans of many years' experience in police work. They must decide in a few seconds what course of action should be taken on a call. They must know every minute what cars are available for assignment. Joe seldom saw those men, but their voices became a part of his life. 8-8. One, three, three, four, one. Mark Twain. Family trouble. <laughs> About 20% of the calls that come into the station are family trouble. And this was Joe's first call. Joe had visions of being a hero, of defending some frail little woman whose husband was mistreating her. But in this
this case, Joe was told by a ruffled lady of the house to mind his own business. If she and her husband wanted to throw things at each other, that was their business. As the weeks went by, Joe began to feel at ease in the daily routine of a scout car patrol. He learned to know the people in his area. It was like keeping his fingers on the pulse of a gigantic heartbeat. This little part of the city that it was his job to protect. Joe and his scout car partner worked as a close team for each other's protection. For they never knew when an assignment, no matter how it sounded, would turn into something vicious and dangerous. 8-4 and 8-8, 2136 West Forest at the payroll office. Hold up in progress. Emergencies like this, all those months of training and experience began to pay off. Joe reported by radio that the holdup men had been taken into custody, but not before Joe's partner had been injured by gunfire. West Side Security Patrol and eight sergeants, 2136 West Forest, an officer shot, wagon on the way. That started Joe thinking, his own partner wounded in line of duty. Sooner or later, it always happens to some friend in the department. And Joe understood now why policemen were considered bad insurance risks.
frequently called the most cosmopolitan city of the Midwest, Detroit today stands at the threshold of a bright new future, one rich with the promise of fulfillment. In this bustling city on the Straits, where British and American flags soon followed the French, a spirit of brotherhood was born and nurtured, foreshadowing the city's national character. Here, people from many nations have met and mixed and built a metropolis of thriving commerce and culture. Detroiters are responding to an exciting new vision. There is a resurgence of civic pride and unfettered imagination. A new renaissance is changing the face of the city. This renaissance, seen everywhere, is the direct result of considered planning, the applied skills of planners, idea men, organizers, builders, Detroiters who welcome and respond to challenges. Today, they are charting new courses, taking new action, creating a new concept of urban efficiency. This concept of a finer Detroit takes bold new form. Designing skill blends with imagination and experience. Sleeves rolled up. Detroit levels and shifts and carves the contours of a new city. And a new spirit of progress matches the vision of its people. New buildings put solid roots in the ground and stretch toward the sky. Reflected here is planning with a purpose. New office buildings alter the landscape, each in turn becoming a bright landmark of progress. Detroit is rebuilding to a master plan of beauty and public service. Detroit is daring to reach up. city is becoming an exciting place to live. Convenient to shops, offices, and the most modern of schools. Some Detroiters prefer to dwell in these new self-contained cities within a city, others in new cooperatives or friendly neighborhoods. Whatever the choice, Detroiters rate their city high for living, working, and sheer enjoyment. Fine restaurants call you to good food. Detroit's manufacturing vision, its automotive genius, is matched by its cultural activities too. The Detroit Institute of Arts houses many of the world's most famous paintings and sculpture. Nearby is Cranbrook, where arts and sciences are taught, enhanced by gardens and fountains of unparalleled beauty. Detroit Public Library houses the world-famous Burton Historical Collection. Adjacent is the Detroit Historical Museum. Detroit, an exciting place to be, to live, to grow, to work shoulder to shoulder, regardless of national origin, color, or creed. Detroit has earned an outstanding record in community relations. Like a stout heart within the city, is Detroit industry, the vital pulse beat of technology and resources which has put the world on wheels. Detroit's strategic location, its reservoir of know-how, its ability to deliver manpower,
places it in the vanguard of choice spots in which to build, manufacture, and expand. The friendliness of its people reaches out, the warmth of the city, the excitement of change, the dedication to progress, social, spiritual, cultural, and material, is equaled only by its 20th century vision. The city on the Straits welcomes you to share that vision as it continues to plan, to build, and yes, to dream.